Next, from pumpkin donuts to pumpkin burgers, we take a trip to Circleville's world famous pumpkin show. Then, a downtown tavern where scandal and intrigue made for gossip and good times. And, the Westgate Mums and Mummies Halloween event, next on Columbus Neighborhoods. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by... At American Electric Power, we've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarters city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State Auto Insurance Companies, transforming to become a digital provider of auto, home, and business insurance and for nearly 100 years, committed to the people and neighborhoods of Central Ohio. State Auto. The Columbus Foundation. Smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri. Your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated. It just needs to be right. CODA. Keeps our community moving forward. Falgren Moortime Marketing and Communications. Think wider. Ohio Health focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities. Women in Philanthropy at Ohio State, changing lives by giving together. And by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU. Thank you. Now way back in history, the third season of the year was simply called Harvest, while spring was named Lent. So it was Lent and harvest. Some folks think that it changed to spring and fall to refer to the leaves on the trees sprouting in the spring and dropping in the fall. Javier, all I know is here in Ohio, I think everybody loves fall because it's finally a break in the heat and Buckeye football starts up again. And there's no better way to experience the sights and sounds of fall than here at Lynn Fruit Farm. Plus, you can't underestimate the power of the pumpkin. I mean, it's a major attraction in Circleville, and if you haven't had a pumpkin donut while taking in all the pumpkin sites, well, you just haven't lived. Take a look. You can get pumpkin included in almost anything in Circleville during pumpkin show. My favorite food is pumpkin donuts. My favorite food is pumpkin pie. Pumpkin pie. Probably on the sweet side, we like the pumpkin uh, brownies a lot. For the non-sweet items, the pumpkin chili and the pumpkin burgers. Sometimes we'll have pumpkin ice cream. I've tried the pumpkin blossoms. Lindsay's Pumpkin Donuts, you know, they've been making them for 50 years, and so they sell out. People line up three blocks long to get a Lindsay's Pumpkin Donut. Wittick's, which is a candy shop here in town, they make pumpkin fudge. There are people with pumpkin cappuccino, pumpkin soda. I've tried pumpkin flavored bacon, which is really interesting, but there are all kinds of pumpkin products available during pumpkin show. Well, the pumpkin show started in 1903. Then Mayor Haswell decided that he needed another means to get the farmers to come to town. And so he asked a number of them to display the crops that they had grown that year. He started out with a display in front of his office. It was about 30 feet long. And that first year, he also invited the Yellow Bud Band to come and play. And so it was just a one-day display. There was corn and crops and a big abundance of pumpkins. And this event was so successful that the next year, a whole block on West Main Street joined him. The merchants kind of got involved in the whole thing. Some of them started up decorating their stores and, and making things look a little more presentable. And this display grew, and it has grown from there. In the 1914, 1915, along in that era, when the rest of the world was beginning what was later known as World War I, Pumpkin Show was growing. They had lights that they installed downtown so that there was actually electric. The Scioto Valley Traction Line was finished, which was a railroad, which brought more people to the event. And Pumpkin Show was still the major thing on the front of the newspaper, not what was going on in the world. 
In the earliest days of the Pumpkin Show, they always had music. The local bands participated at various times. Back then, they would have a fellow that, that walked across the high wire. It was one of the entertainment factors. And they had a big cable that went from the courthouse down. And they would go on the top of the courthouse and ride this cable down. They would have sideshows like the fat lady or see the, the boy that was, had different joints and things like that or had skin blemishes or something that made him look like a snake. And over the years, they've, they've of course done away with those type of shows, even at the state fair. But uh, I can remember the man that was frozen. Uh, they came in here, they had found a fellow that was petrified. And you would put a quarter in a slot, of course, and be able to go in and see the petrified man. Of course, the rides have changed over the years, and of course, the big ride we had was the Ferris wheel. That and the octopus, I can remember, were probably the, the biggest rides that we had at that time. And of course, the fun houses were always fun to go in. We all looked forward to it because school was out, and we got to go downtown. We walked around with friends, met people. Food was a big thing, and not always was it made out of pumpkin, but pumpkin pie was always around. Lindsay's Bake Shop. Ernie Lindsay was the founder, and he, he made most of the pumpkin pies for the show. At that time, you know, the, the, the show wasn't as large, and of course, and they could keep up production, uh, the pumpkin pies. And of course, why it's all about pumpkins, this was the, the area where the pumpkins were grown, and where we had, you know, three or four canning factories that canned the pumpkin. And so he kind of continued with that by making pumpkin pies and selling them at the festival. In 1952, he baked and put the largest pumpkin pie in his bakery window, and it's been an attraction ever since. The churches and service organizations set up stands around the town. In one of the earlier years, there were 27 hamburger stands, and there were what they called 18th Amendment emporiums, and they could only serve tea, coffee, lemonade, cider, and drinks like that. One of the merchants downtown in 1906 decided that it would be a really great idea if they had a baby show as a part of the show. Um, as, as it says in the history books, he was a single gentleman and had a business downtown. And everyone was very concerned that he really didn't know what he was getting himself into, but they thought he would learn a lot about babies and their mothers by the time the show was over. Well, 42 babies were entered into that first baby show, and last year we had about 380 babies participate in the baby parade and show. Like a lot of little girls in Pickaway County, I was a contestant in the Little Miss Pumpkin Show. Got to ride through a parade on a car, my sister and I were contestants, but we didn't win. In the 1930s, they started the Miss Pumpkin Show contest. And at the time, just ladies who were seniors in high school could participate, and they came from all of the high schools all over. Since that time, our pumpkin show royalty, or the queens and their attendants, visit festivals all over the state of Ohio. It is a great opportunity for them to represent Ohio and to represent the pumpkin show. In the 1980s began the beginning of the Pumpkin Growers Association. That meant that pumpkins began increasing in size significantly in the displays that were happening at the pumpkin show. In 87, there were 13 entries for the pumpkin show in the largest pumpkin category, and the winning pumpkin was 317 pounds. By the 1990s, the largest pumpkin was 473 pounds, and at 2005, it was 951.5 pounds. Obviously, they got better at growing pumpkins very quickly, and they started all sharing the secrets that they had between the farmers who were growing those pumpkins. It's not competitive cutthroat. It's like if Jerry would call me up and say, you know, I've got a little problem with my leaf. Would you come take a look at it and see what you think? And so we, you know, we share information, suggest things they might do to improve them, you know, stop a disease, kill a bug, you know, things like that. If, if, but we all want to win. We've won the pumpkin show 12 years, but we help each other. 
The record pumpkin at the Circleville Pumpkin Show was grown in 2014. It weighed 1,964 pounds, and it was my wife's and my pumpkin. Dad started in the 30s, and they made him a trustee in charge of the chickens and the turkeys. And then in the 46, he became the secretary of the Circleville Pumpkin Show. He spent 55 years as a secretary. Then I took over as a secretary in 1990, so this will be my 28th year. My son has been made a trustee, and he will probably take over as a secretary someday. So it's home for us. I think what is really amazing is the number of volunteers from the local community. I'm not sure if anybody doesn't volunteer or work in the pumpkin show. I think when you get that many people involved, then it becomes very much a part of the community. We also like to show off Circleville. We think it's a great place to live, and Pickaway County is a great agricultural community. Over 80% of our ground in this county is still dedicated to agriculture. And so us being able to have Pumpkin Show as a great display of agriculture is very important to the community. And I think that makes it very much a part of what we all want to be a part of. Next, the Bots Tavern, where billiards and intrigue are baked into its history. Then, an entire community bonds over mums and mummies. Now, back in the day, if you wanted to spend some quality time with friends, you'd head to the tavern. Sounds like a nice, comfortable place to settle into a crisp fall night. Mm -hmm. And did you know you can still visit one of the oldest taverns in downtown Columbus? Downtown Columbus used to be full of old, quirky little places, uh, restaurants and bars and things like that. And some of them are still left. We're going to visit one. It's called the Elevator Brewery. It began life as the Bott Brothers Saloon in the late 19th century. It has a unique storefront. Architecturally, there's nothing else like it in Columbus, and it's a really interesting place. Hi, Kevin. Hey, Jeff. How you doing? Fine, thanks. Thanks so much for having us over. Yeah, welcome to the elevator. We've got to be in one of the most historic places in Columbus. Yeah, elevator's only been here since 2000, but okay. the original architecture is all back from 1897. And tell me some of the history. One of the coolest things, the back bar here was built for the Chicago World's Exposition back in uh, 1893. Okay. And then, obviously, the guys, the Bopp brothers who opened up this place, had a lot of money, and they shipped that here by rail. Wow. Back when we opened in 1897. You know, looking at the size of the bar, that must have been quite a project. Yeah, can't imagine. I mean, a lot of this stuff up here, going all the way back to the clock there is all original. Even the tile floor was put in. Well, that's what's so remarkable. I remember, I remember the days when the exterior was covered back oh, before about 1980 or so. Oh, you didn't know this, the wonderful stained glass and all of the, all the glass work, the domes and everything yeah. was here. Completely intact. <laughs> It's beautiful stained glass, and that's all, all original well, stained glass. Well, can we glass get a better look at the bar? Yeah, it's, absolutely. It looks really wonderful. Yeah, as I mentioned, pretty much all original Philippine mahogany, got the white onyx pillars. The only thing that's really not original is the marble bar top. Uh, this used to actually be the walls of a barber shop that used to be downstairs. <laughs> it's actually now our walk-in cooler well, now, but this, they did that back in the So 60s. this was kind of a full service place, barber shop. I remember a cigar stand over mm -hmm. in this area, is that right? I've seen pictures okay, of that. Okay, and yep. of course billiards upstairs. Yep. I remember there was a sign that said, ladies welcome in the billiards room. <laughs> I'm sure they were welcome I, I to think some I extent. I think I remember that. <laughs> um, obviously, some modern touches with the with the brewery equipment we have now. Obviously, so that brewing, wasn't here. brewing actually takes place here in the restaurant. Is that right? Yes, this is our small production brewery. Um, mm -hmm. Just do about three barrels per per batch here. Our main brewery is two blocks over there. How on does course. that translate into gallons, which is what I'm more familiar with? Uh, there's about let's see, one barrel is about 30 gallons. Okay. Uh, okay. A barrel is actually two kegs. So. Okay. Okay. You get about six kegs out of it, it's great. Our yeah. brewmaster, Doug, uses a lot to play around with. Try well, that's, things. that's one of the smaller brewing outfits I've seen. It's really interesting to see them, kind of that size or that scale. Absolutely. So the stairway is all original? Yep. 
And then the, the female figures in the side windows, as far as you know, those were original as well? I think these were brought, from what I've been told from people who know way more about stained glass, is that it's more painted, so it's probably when Lisa did the major renovations back in the 1960s. Okay. They, were they, brought cer in. they certainly look old, mm -hmm. but may not have come from, uh, they probably came from somewhere else rather than not being original right. to the yeah. place, but it certainly adds to the character. Yeah, we get a lot of people that think this used to be a church or a theater or something with all the stained glass, but yeah, it's always been a bar. Well, I suppose for some people it was a matter of religion to be here, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, used to be, again, this is all things I've been told, but there used to be a brothel up on the upper floors and supposedly they'd come down and line up on the balcony here and you'd I guess that was a fact of life in a certain time period. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and this looks like a newer part here. Uh, was it always part of the restaurant as far as you know? As far as I know, yeah. I have some pictures when it was back when it was the clock restaurant and all this okay. was kind of part of it. There were some doors that opened up and went over to the other side where there used to be kind of a, a dance club well, over it, there. Well, it's a different level of decoration, sort of architectural character, but it's still pretty outstanding with the pressed metal ceiling. That's obviously original, obviously all still in place. Yeah. And so often these were seriously damaged, either by inattention and they'd get rusty, or you know you cut through to put in mechanical systems and stuff. This, oh, yeah. is, this is in pretty good shape. Yeah, very fortunate. I know since the 60s there hasn't been a ton of renovations, just kind of some upkeep yeah. and painting and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. A lot of the artwork was the original owner, Dick Stevens. Um, now, at what time period was he owning the building? He owned the restaurant from 2000 to 2009. Okay, well, and more great stained glass. Yeah, so again, what I've been told is that this was rescued from a church that was being torn down on East Broad Street back in the 20s. Wow. Uh, took it apart, disassembled it, yeah, brought it over yeah, here, yeah. and kind of put it all back together. It's just backlit with some light bulbs behind it's, it. It's a, it's a beautiful piece of work, it does, but it does have a religious theme. Obviously, an angel, the palm leaves. Yep, and as we go on back, we get the two antique pool tables. The first one is actually one of the original Bop Brothers tables. Oh, so it's from, it's from the building, from the restaurant. Yeah, this one was actually, from what I know, this one was actually built at their previous location around the 1880s and then was brought here. But it's still active, right? Yeah, yep, people still play. There were people playing here earlier today. Great. And that one was actually brought up from Europe, uh, built in 1879. Wow, they but, really are something. And that, that painting's actually what the upstairs used to look like. There used I to be 40 know. tables upstairs, 20 on this side wow. and then 20 on the other side. The gentleman with the, kind of doing one of these, he yeah. was a local boxer named Shifty Dando that actually used to compete in boxing matches that, back in the day and I guess hung out here with Fats Domino and some that others. Is, that is a boxing pose for sure. And then one, one, one last piece of really great colored glass. Uh, again, it's hard to say for sure, it's heritage. Apparently not done for the building, but brought here from elsewhere as far as you know. As far as I know, yeah. Boy, it's a marvelous place. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, I actually used to come here before I started working here or anything and have drinks at the bar and it was really crowded back then. And I never really noticed the beauty of it until one night well, everybody was gone and took a second to look you around. You take a look around, yeah, wow. where there's no distraction. Exactly. Well, it was Bop Brothers for a long time. I myself don't know when it might have become, what we let's say, the first version of the clock restaurant, which I understand closed in 1979. I know it opened up just not too long after Prohibition ended. So, okay. Because during so Prohibition, that, oh, right. speakeasy So that was probably that, what so. it was, and I don't know where the clock, well, I had a clock out front, I remember. But that was when it was just sort of a downtown diner dive kind of place. Yep. And then uh, Lisa Galat took it over about 1980, as I recall, and, and, and still called it the clock. You said you came and... We've been here since March 2000. Okay. Yeah, there were a handful of restaurants yeah. that came and went before we right. came in. Downtown wasn't what it is today with as yeah. many people living down yeah, here. Yeah, things have changed. Exactly. Downtown resident picture is way different. So, so the customer base over the years, I'm sure, is much different from Absolutely. what it was. And, and right now, with all the condos being built all around us, it's kind of well, yeah, kind of yeah. crazy. I mean, yeah, here comes a ready-made market for you. You're in the right place at the right time. Absolutely. Well, I really appreciate it. Thanks so much for, for showing me around. Oh, my it's just It's a terrific place, and uh, best luck for the future. Yeah. Thank you very much. Central Ohio Beggar's Night is one of the most popular nights of the year. It's right up there with Christmas Day. No doubt. And what's not to love? Candy by the bucket full and neighbors having fun with either decorating their homes or just hanging out together. Now the Westgate neighborhood is up the ante because it's more than a sugar high and it's more than just one night. 
One of the things that I've always said is a connected neighborhood is a safer neighborhood. And so we try to do things that will bring the neighbors together. And Moms and Mummies is just one of those events. What it is, it's a fall afternoon in the park. We invite families from all over the hilltop. Inside the shelter house, we'll have crafts. We'll have a costume contest for the children as well as pets. There will be a mum sale that will benefit Friends of Westgate Park. It's just a delightful afternoon for everyone to come out and enjoy our park. October is really magical in Westgate. We have this 47 acre park that uh, we utilize for a lot of things throughout the year, but in the fall, we have a mom research project. Tom Prince reached out to one of the growers and they wanted to do a research project in the Midwest to figure out what types of moms would survive the winter. The mom project actually started about six or seven years ago. The idea with mums is they provide color in the park when the park is kind of waning for the year in that area, September, October, and into November. We have a research bed here, a thousand square foot research bed. We've divided into four blocks. 25 varieties in this bed, 25 varieties in each of the other beds. We do that to, so when we take our data, it's not influenced by variation in soil or variation in light. I select the varieties that have unique colors, new forms, some that have colors not normally seen. We want to show people the diversity of mums. In the gardening world, there's probably six to 800 varieties of mums. So here are the different varieties and we have them all tagged. This one's Pink Frenzy, pink variety. And this one back here, uh, Fire Glow Bronze. It's a bicolor bronze variety. One nicety of the research is we actually get some of the new varieties that are coming into the marketplace to be tested. So we're gonna have some new varieties here that the consumers can see that will be on the marketplace next year. The first mums come into flower probably about the first or second week of September. The mid-season varieties come into flower around early October. And then the late season varieties come in late October to November. Each variety will probably stay in flower for six to eight weeks. And then after the winter time, about April of the next year, we dig up each plant and decide, has it survived the winter or not? Purple varieties tend to be stronger. Red varieties tend to be stronger in survival. Unfortunately, the popular colors like the yellow and the bronze, sometimes those aren't as hardy. That's what the companies are interested in. And then they can take that information in their breeding genetics to start developing varieties that are more hardy. I mean, my favorite ghost story deals with North Market simply because North Market is the site of the Old North Graveyard. Basically, John Kerr, the second mayor of Columbus, and one of the four proprietors of Columbus, ends up giving a plot of land immediately outside the city limits, which at that time was Nationwide Boulevard, just on the north side of town, to forever be a cemetery. The problem with closing it down, city officials found, was that a lot of that land was given to the city with the idea that it would perpetually be used as either a cemetery or for some other public use. Well, no longer wishing to keep it a cemetery, city officials had to find another public use. Eventually they found one with North Market. The North Market will essentially replace much of what is the old North Graveyard site. So from 1856 on, persons are encouraged to remove family members or other friends to another location. But the general idea was to try to get that cemetery emptied. They didn't. Roughly about half the people, we think, buried in that cemetery are still there. That includes John Kerr. This may help explain why on diverse Halloween nights, sometimes in the fog, if one looks occasionally from time to time, it's been reported, you can see a fella walking along near the north side of the North Market, dressed in the style 
1813. Thanks for being with us, and remember you can catch all our episodes on ColumbusNeighborhoods.org. Plus, see our stories on the WOSU mobile app. <laughs> and you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll see you back here next week on Columbus Neighborhoods. Hey, pass me one. Sure. Pumpkin pie tastes so good. I'd eat it all if I could. But Mom told me I had to share, so this one's for you. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by... At American Electric Power, we've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarter city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State Auto Insurance Companies, transforming to become a digital provider of auto, home, and business insurance and for nearly 100 years, committed to the people and neighborhoods of Central Ohio. State Auto. The Columbus Foundation. Smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri. Your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated. It just needs to be right. CODA. Keeps our community moving forward. Falgren Wartime Marketing and Communications. Think wider. Ohio Health focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities. Women in Philanthropy at Ohio State, changing lives by giving together. And by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU. Thank you.